why did you take the time now to write your autobiography? Well, I, I wrote a book in the late nineties, which, which, uh, you know, was, was fun and we, we, we'd accomplished a lot in the first, you know, decade and a half of the company, but certainly a lot had occurred in the last decade. And I was also at a place where I'm much more comfortable disclosing things and be, being vulnerable. And I wanted to share a lot of the personal reflections and struggles and challenges and really what I was feeling during all those moments. And so that's what I did. And, you know, uh, with, with the go private and the, you know, it was the biggest take private ever in technology. And then we did the biggest acquisition ever in technology and transformed the company and then went public again. A lot of friends encouraged me to write a book about all that. And so here it is. Yeah, and and it's a great story. I mean, the the parts I love about it is the origin story. Uh, pretty amazing to think uh, you were coming of age in the eighties, watching all these PCs, and like myself, you had a subscription to Byte Magazine, to PC <laughs> Magazine. You became friends with Jim Seymour, the columnist, who I didn't know was actually in Austin, uh, but you were obsessed with business at a young age, and you saw this opportunity in PCs. What was the opportunity you saw in the personal computer? When did you see it? Uh, and then what, tell, take us to that moment when you decided, I'm not just going to upgrade people's computers and make a couple of grand doing that. Just saying, you know what, this actually is a company I'm going to go direct to consumer. Well, yeah, I was really fortunate, you know, uh, to be, first of all, in a, in a junior high school, a public junior high school in Houston, Texas, where there was a teletype terminal. And I learned about, you know, Radio Shack and the TRS-80 and Byte Magazine. And it was kind of the dawn of the microprocessor age. And, and so grew up with all that through junior high school and high school. And, you know, it, it, it was kind of a, a fun thing to do and to make some extra money. And I was teaching kids how to program and upgrading their dad's computers and, that sort of thing. It wasn't until my parents told me that I needed to focus on my studies and, and, you know, get serious about college, uh, that I really decided, well, th this was something more. This was something I really wanted to do for the rest of my life. And, uh, you know, I was always fascinated with the power of calculators and computing machines and the idea that anybody could have their own personal computer and program it. That was, just an incredibly empowering and exciting idea to me. And of course, I had no idea that, you know, it would go from a million or two million computers to billions of them. And, you know, now, you know, five billion people walking around with smartphones. It's, it's an incredible world that's, that's evolved in the last, you know, several decades here. Yeah. And you, you tell this great story of, you know, saving up money. And then going to buy your first computer, your dad's support for that. Maybe tell that story of like when you actually bought your first computer. Yeah. So, so I, I'd read, I'd read in Byte magazine about the Apple II and mm -hmm. it was sort of a, you know, obviously a big leap from the Apple one. And, you know, the TRS 80 was, was okay, but the Apple II was, you know, highly programmable and, I had uh, saved up enough money, you know, doing stamp auctions and all sorts of other kind of entrepreneurial things as a as a kid that I had the money to buy one of these. So I, you know, convinced my parents to let me buy one. And um, you know, first thing I did was take it apart because that mm. that the, that was sort of what I did with all electronics because you couldn't really understand how it worked unless you took it apart and. Um, you know, it, it, it was, it was a super fun time because computers then were easily understandable. You know, t today, it, you know, it's kind of hard to open them up to begin with, but yeah. even if you do open them up, you have a bunch of black boxes, which are, you know, massive ASIC chips that combine all sorts of different functions. Then every single chip, you could understand exactly what it was doing and you could, actually program it yourself you could re reprogram the bios and all of that was just you know incredibly exciting to me and you had to open it up to actually put more memory chips in and they didn't have 
there was no internet connections at that time. There's no ethernet. I mean, to upgrade the machine was a qu- requirement. It was kind of like owning a muscle car or something at that time, uh, which I think led you to see that first opportunity. Was the first opportunity reali- really that you realized this was too complicated for people to upgrade their own machines, so I'll just do it for them? Or was it the PC? I guess it was the PC AT or the PC XT. I'm not sure which one you, or maybe it was just called IBM PC at that time, but you were finding PCs from around the country, arbitraging them. And then basically adding memory to them and taking the spread on it for people. Yeah, I had a couple of businesses. I had yeah. I had the business of, you know, the, the there 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 was an inefficient system of how these IBM PCs were being, you know, uh, allocated across the country, and so I had this kind of flying by business where I'd find too many machines in one city and not enough in another city. I you know, generally on the weekend when I was in when I was in school here in Austin, I would you know take so- a Southwest Airlines flight to a city, rent a U-Haul truck, load it up with fifty or seventy PCs, fly it to another city. You know, take you know <laughs> you know make it make make a couple thousand bucks and you know head back to Austin. Uh, the, That's the, the hilarious. Other- <laughs> I mean, you literally were arbitraging city by city inventory issues. And selling these to dentists, et cetera. Your dad was an author. Well, no, that, no, that, no, that 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 I was selling them really between computer stores. Ah, where, where, uh, and and the other thing I was doing was I was upgrading the IBM PCs. You know, either buying the basic stripped down IBM PC, put more memory in it, put more floppy drives in it. You know, eventually the hard disk drives. Started to come along before IBM had the XT. You could add a hard disk drive to a PC, and I would buy hard disk drives and controller cards, write some software, make cables, and make a kit to upgrade an IBM PC to have a hard disk drive, which was a big deal at the time because you know putting yeah. floppy, floppy drives in was like super slow. So all of that. You know, kind of, uh, I, I got this incredible view into not only how people were using them and th- the power of that, but the whole distribution system was really inefficient and mm. it just looked like a, a huge opportunity. Okay, in 2012, childhood friends came together to build NordVPN after spending time apart in different areas of the world. While separated, they saw a growing need for an easily accessible internet security tool. So they created their own VPN, Virtual Private Network. With NordVPN, they're helping people stay safe online and improving VPN services globally. So with NordVPN, you can access content from over 59 different countries by changing your virtual location with one click. It's so elegant and simple to just say, I want to be in the UK now. I want to be in Australia. I want to be in New York. You know what? I use it. And sometimes I pop open my iPad and I'm in Italy and it says, oh, you're in Italy. You can't use Disney+. Plus. You know what? My kids need to watch a Disney film. Now, on top of all that, do you know how you get hacked? You get hacked because you're on public Wi-Fi. If you use NordVPN, you're just not going to be subject to all those open Wi-Fi hacks. So here's an amazing deal. Go to NordVPN.com slash twist or use the code twist, T-W-I-S-T, and you will get 73%. 73, not 7%, not 3%, 73% off your two-year plan plus four bonus months for free. So for U.S. customers, NordVPN will cost you about one cup of coffee per month, about three bucks. Claim this offer fast, set it and forget it, and protect yourself forever. It's for a limited time only. 